Elijah, the prophet who shocks, who challenges, who confronts, the messenger of God who calls down fire from heaven. But even prophets exist as part of the body of Christ and need help of others. When Elijah announces a great drought, he experiences community through an unlikely source. Even though the widow and her son had almost nothing, they helped a stranger, and through that saw God move. Elijah must reclaim his purpose in an unlikely moment when he allowed fear to overtake him. Our seasons in the spiritual valleys tend to follow our mountaintop moments. But it is there, always there, that God meets us in our need and shows us our path back to him. But Elijah's calling wasn't fulfilled only in what he did, but in who he discipled, calling Elisha to become a messenger of the Lord and to take on his spirit. Elijah is known for being one of the greatest prophets in scripture appearing with Moses beside Jesus at a moment known as the Transfiguration. But the moment that Elijah is most known for is an encounter with God, a showdown between the prophets of Baal and the Lord. Not a fairy tale, a bloody, fiery, transformative encounter. Hey church, I'm going to invite you to stand to your feet. I know you've already stood for a while, but we got five verses we're going to cover right here at the very beginning. 1 Kings chapter 18, beginning in verse 36. This is, a, this is a passage that I have preached three different times. Here's my full confession is that I had every intention when we went through it this time of doing it like I did it last time. You weren't there. But every time I've gone through this passage, God has used it to take my faith to a different level. And he's shown me something different that I never saw before because I wasn't ready for it. Scripture says that he will give us a word in season, in season. And I believe that he's doing something in this season that he hasn't done in any other season. And I believe he's doing it in your life. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 36. It says, At the time of sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. I love this part because he references the people who they knew that God had moved during their lifetime. Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. He references the stories, the testimonies of the greatness of God in prior lifetimes. And says, let it be known today that you're still moving. Answer me, Lord. Answer me. So these people will know that you, Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. Then Elijah commanded them, seize the prophets of Baal, don't let anyone get away. They seized them, and Elijah had them brought down to the Kishon Valley and slaughtered there. Man, I just got to tell you, today is just going to be one of those days. Today is going to be one of those days that I believe that for many of us are going to serve as a marker that God is doing something different. And we'll be able to point back to this day, the weekend that everybody else was at the beach. We say, oh, how glad I am that I came to church because God did something in my life. Do you believe that today, Highland Park? I believe it for you, even if you don't. Amen. Hey, turn to your neighbor. Say, today's going to be a day. 
and you can grab a seat. As we are walking through this series, we are walking through the pattern in which God moves. Our language, His pattern, that we see throughout Scripture and we see in our very lives today that when God moves, not, not that He's seeking to be predictable, that there are certain things He continuously does. He will bring people into your life. He will give you a renewed vi vision, a new spirit of Him. He will give you opportunity to take hold of things that you had previously let go of. And he will direct your life, allowing you to know that there is a calling upon your life. We put language to these things. That we believe that God calls us to experience community, to encounter him, to claim purpose, and to pursue calling, not happiness, calling. <laughs> that happiness comes with it as you know that there is something more significant that God is doing in your life. Again, this is how God moves. We just said, hey, let's put, let's put some words to it, some phrases to describe it. I, I think it is important to understand that God moves in each and every phase, that God is active and alive. I think we run a difficulty if all we pursue is the encounter with God, forgetting that in the rest of our lives there are things that we are supposed to be doing. It leads us into spots where we pursue spiritual highs. We pursue the emotional elation of knowing we're in the presence of God. And I want you to know that like God is moving in your life whether you feel good about it or not. <laughs> Does that make sense? <laughs> like God is moving in powerful ways. You just may not like it in the moment. <laughs> I mean, how, what, what an incredible testimony would that be if that's how we started answering instead of like, how you doing? Like, it's okay for you to be, like the prophet Elijah for most of his life is completely miserable. <laughs> and God is still using him in profound ways. Like, how you doing? Miserable. But God's active. <laughs> Man, that'd be, that'd be great. Why don't you turn to your neighbor and say, I'm miserable. But God's moving. Come on, that's the most honest most of you have ever been in church. Can we acknowledge that in the moment? You're like, oh, there it is. It felt good to get that off my chest in a moment. He's moving in all the phases. And yet there is no doubt that there is something powerful about the encounter with God. It is, the, it is the engine that keeps the whole thing moving. The encounter with God is the moment, not, 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 not just the spiritual high, but it is the moment in which God becomes real to you. It's not just belief, it's not just routine, it's not just ideas anymore, but you know that there is a God and he knows you by name. The, the, uh, man, Job, I was going to say prophet. He's not a prophet. <laughs> Just because he's Old Testament doesn't make him a prophet. Job, this guy Job, not Job, Job. He has this incredible struggle, suffering in his life. And after 40 some odd chapters of arguing with his friends, which are recorded in Scripture, quite the page turner, he makes this confession. He says, my ears had heard of you but now my eyes have seen you. That's what I want for you. My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. I have always believed that the purpose of the gathering of the church is to encounter God. Not, not to learn something, I hope you learn something, but to encounter Him. Not to take a bunch of notes, hope you take notes. I'll be honest with you, I don't even care if you take notes. <laughs> I hope you encounter him. I, don't, I want you to walk into church week after week and evaluate what happens based upon the coffee <laughs> or how many new things you learned or if the songs you liked. But only based upon the parameters was God's spirit here, living, moving, and active. This is why we're here. And one of the most significant encounters in all of Scripture happens, my favorite, happens in 1 Kings chapter 18. Very quick context. Three weeks ago, we looked at 1 Kings chapter 17. 
in which Elijah has decreed that because the people have turned from God, that there would be a three-year drought. They didn't know it was going to be three years at the time, but turns into a three-year drought. God sends Elijah and goes and feeds him through ravens that bring him food and by a brook that runs by. God dries the brook up to send Elijah to a new place for, to help a widow. There, as he is helping the widow and God healing, like miracles, feed them every single day. Her son gets sick and dies, and God heals him in a powerful, powerful way. All of these building the faith of Elijah, leading to this moment in 1 Kings chapter 18. So today we're just going to walk straight through it. It says, after a long time, of drought. In the third year, the word of the Lord came to Elijah, go present yourself to Ahab, the king, the king who has turned the people from God, and I will send rain on the land. So Elijah went to present himself to Ahab. Now the famine was severe in Samaria, and Ahab had summoned Obadiah, his palace administrator. Obadiah was a devout believer in the Lord. While Jezebel, the queen, was killing off the Lord's prophets, Obadiah had taken a hundred prophets and hidden them in two caves, fifty in each, and had supplied them with food and water. Fun fact, Obadiah, the prophet, actually has a book of the Bible named after him. The name of the book, it's like 23 verses long, it's a short guy, is Obadiah. He's not very creative. 21 verses. I lied. He continues. Verse 7. It says, as Obadiah was walking along, Elijah met him. Obadiah recognized him, bowed down to the ground and said, is it really you, my lord Elijah? Yes, he replied. Go tell your master, the king, Elijah is here. What have I done wrong? Asked Obadiah that you are handing your servant over to Ahab to be put to death. Feels a little bit like an overreaction. Is that okay for us to say? <laughs> like, Obadiah, chill out, bro. I just asked you to go tell him that I'm here. This is similar to when I tell my kids that I need them to put their plate in the dishwasher. And they look at me and they go, do I have to do everything around here? <laughs> Verse 10. As surely as the Lord your God lives, there is not a nation or kingdom, this is Obadiah speaking, where my master, the king, has not sent someone to look for you. And whenever a nation or kingdom claimed you were not there, he made them swear they could not find you. But now you tell me to go to my master and say, Elijah is here? I don't know where the spirit of the Lord may carry you when I leave you. If I go and tell Ahab and he doesn't find you, he will kill me. Yet I have worshiped the Lord since my youth. Haven't you heard? I love this. He's like, Elijah, I'm a good guy. Like, don't, don't do this to me. Haven't you heard what I did when I hit a hundred of the Lord's prophets in two caves, 50 in each, and supplied them with food and water? And now you tell me to go to my master and say, Elijah is here. He will kill me. Elijah said, as surely as the Lord Almighty lives, whom I serve, I will present myself to Ahab today. After three years of drought... After three years of Ahab pursuing Elijah and trying to find him, they are finally going to meet. After three years of Elijah proclaiming that Ahab had turned the people away from God, we are finally going to see them encounter each other. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. When he saw Elijah, he said to him, is that you you troubler of Israel. I don't think he worked on that opening line long. Can we acknowledge that? You're going to meet Elijah after three years. You will search for him. You kill him. First words. Is that you, you troubler of Israel? And this is Elijah's response. I have not made trouble for Israel. <laughs> it's like, I feel like this is like a toddler back and forth. Can I just acknowledge that? Is that you, you troubler? I'm not the troubler. You're the troubler. 
You and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the Baals. Now summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets of the false god Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah, the false god, who eat at Jezebel, the queen's table. Let's hang here for just a second. Elijah, the faithful prophet of God, is greeted by the king as the troubler of Israel. If the world was aligned with God, your step of faithfulness would be greeted with celebration. But the world is not. And so your step of obedience will be seen as a disturbance. The moment in which you begin stepping into, aligning yourself with what God has for you. Can, can I just prep you for this? Don't expect everyone around you to be like, woo, we're so thrilled. I, I wanna tell you like, as a church, we'll celebrate you. But, but the reality of most of our relationships is most people don't want to love you and support you at all things. They want to control you and know that you are dependable based upon their uses. And so then when you step into what God has for you, we expect it to be greeted with rejoicing. And it's not. The only faithful prophet of God is greeted by the king. We could work on the language, but troublemaker? I'm not a troublemaker. You're a troublemaker. It's silly, but it's real. I need to prep you for this. I need you to know this, otherwise you're gonna be thrown off when God actually does something in your life. Can I tell you what people told me? And they were, like, they were right, like they weren't lying, they just like, didn't finish the whole account. Does that make sense? Like it's like, I don't know, maybe it was me. Maybe I'm a bad listener, that's kind of why I do this. I don't have to listen nearly as much. Like maybe I just didn't hang around long enough and they were gonna finish it. But people will say like, if you follow Jesus, he brings peace. That's kind of true, but the full statement is, if you follow Jesus, he brings peace eventually, <laughs> not immediately. Oh, is, has anyone else found this to be true? Yeah. Oh, there we go. Hey, say amen if you found this to be true. Yeah. There we go, because people told me, like, when, when you follow God, he'll bring peace, and then things in my life started falling apart, and it was like, this doesn't feel like peace. I don't think you guys understand what peace is. I can't hang on that. This isn't working. This isn't working anymore. Peace eventually. Peace in your soul now, but not peace in your circumstances. First, God has to shake the whole thing up to set it in order of where it's supposed to be. If you're in a season in which God is shaking it up, don't be scared. Don't be afraid. Don't come complaining all the time, like, I don't know why I have so much trouble. Expect this to happen in your life. Like, one of the things we talk about, and this is so important in faith, is that you can stand on the promises of God. No one preaching with me today? You can stand on the promises of God. What God has promised, he will be faithful in, you can count on, amen? But let's hang on what all the promises of God are. Let me, can, can I just give you one of the promises of God? John 16. In this world, you will have trouble. Ooh, where'd you go? I mean, I only had the amens for like half a second. <laughs> In this world, you will have trouble. That's not how to get, bring people to faith. Can I just acknowledge that? You're sitting there and I'm like, Kevin, I brought my skeptic friend today. I didn't know how this was gonna go. In this world, you will have trouble. You'll be trouble for the people around you. They'll call you a troublemaker. You'll have trouble. Amen, let's go home. I mean, come on, there's a promise of God, we're good. <laughs> In this world, you will have trouble, but then the back part of the verse says this, but take heart, I have overcome the world. See, this is what I believe is I believe that you're never gonna realize that back half of the promise if you're not willing to endure the first half. You're never gonna see that God is the God who has overcome the world if you're not willing to step into the uncertainty, the difficulty that he has for you in the present moment. You know, you know how dumb, the, let me just like, confession, okay? Full confession. 
I trust that God can do all things. And yet every single time he calls me to step out in faith, he has to pull me kicking and screaming. Never once in my entire life has God been like, step out in faith. And I'll be like, can't wait. Is that okay for me to say? Like every single time I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. I told you a couple weeks ago about like when we had to leave a ministry that we started early on and God was like, it's no longer yours to lead. And my response to God was, what does that mean? How stupid am I? Like how clear could God get in those moments? And yet every single time I'm like, it sounds like a lot of work, God. <laughs> I will take you from glory to glory. I'm like, it sounds like a lot of work, man. Man, how, how awful would it be to get to heaven and to give an excuse like that for why he did not show his glory through our very lives? Wouldn't that just be the worst? Like to, to come before God and be like, this is what I want to do through your life. And you're like, felt pretty uncomfortable, God. Like I would have talked with them when you prompted me, but I didn't know what to do with my hands. If I would have known what to do with my hands, I would have been obedient. In this world, you'll have trouble. I'll say that to your neighbor. Say, you'll have trouble. But take heart. Oh, keep going. Preach it with me. But take heart. God has overcome the world. Come on, church. Let's celebrate that today. We serve a God who has overcome, who takes us into new things. Ahab said, greets Elijah. Is that you? You troubler of Israel, Elijah says, I haven't made trouble. You've made trouble. Meet me and all the false prophets on Mount Carmel. Verse 20. So Ahab sent word throughout all Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. Elijah went before the people and said, how long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. I don't know. I'm not going to try to make this sound brilliant because I don't know how because it's so simple. Okay? Uh, Elijah, man, I love how blunt he is. He goes, is the thing that you're following God? If it isn't, then don't follow it. <laughs> if it is, then follow it. No one's taking notes. Maybe that's because I told you I don't care if you take notes. Let me try to say it differently, more, more brilliantly this time. If God is God, like the creator, the maker, the sustainer, the author, if God is God, then we should probably follow him, right? Regardless if we understand it or not, right? regardless if we know what to do with our hands or not, right? If he's God, then we follow him. But if he's not God, then we wouldn't follow him, right? It seems so simple, doesn't it? And Elijah's, his critique of the people is he goes, he doesn't say that they don't understand that he's God, he asks this question, he says, how long will you waver? How long will you go back and forth? How long will you, will you go with God for a minute and then do something else? God, I give my life wholly to you. But those people look like they're having a lot of fun. I'm gonna go see what they're doing for a minute. God, I trust you entirely. But this is getting a little awkward. Let me try something else for a little bit. He goes, if he's God, then follow him. Like all of it, all your days, every bit of you. If he's not, then go do something else. It's like we get in this like weird thing with faith, like we get this like buyer's remorse. Like this idea like, I'm gonna get a little into it and then I don't really know how it's gonna go and I'm gonna try, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try something else. This is like my family, every single time we go out to eat at a table, like everybody is certain of what they want when they order it and then the food comes and they act like our, our food that we ordered is a general buffet. It is not. And I just have to remind my kids every time, like, listen, I love you. 
Everything I have is yours, excluding what is on my plate. You keep your fork on your plate. This is mine. Oh, come on, can I get an amen in here? Somebody, there we go. Can I just say it like this? You can't date God. You can't try God. You can try Alpha, not God. Like that's not what it is. It's not, it's not meant to be a relationship where you go, I'm, gonna, I'm, just gonna, I'm just gonna give it a shot. I'm gonna see how it goes. He's either God or he's not. See, this is the, this is the difficulty. When, when God speaks throughout scripture of the wavering of his people, he doesn't speak of it in terms of disobedience. That's what we think, right? We think, oh, I disobeyed God. This is not how God speaks. Like, if we disobeyed God, it, it would be the understanding that God is like a vending machine and he wasn't giving us what we wanted, so we went to the other vending machine. We go, I don't need another drink. I want some chips. I'm going over here, see what they got. And this is how we operate in our lives. God doesn't give us what we think we wanted in the moment. Are we, am I stepping on too many toes right now? Is that why we all died a little bit? <laughs> Like, God didn't give us what we wanted in the moment, so I'm going to try over here, and I'm going to try God for a little bit, and then romantic relationship. God for a little bit, and then, and then I'll try sports. God for a little bit, and then I'll try my career, and I'll, I'll come back to God whenever I'll see that this doesn't work out and didn't give me what we wanted. But he doesn't speak in terms of disobedience. He speaks in terms of betrayal. It's not you didn't give me what I wanted. It's we were in covenant together and then you went off and you went with someone else. God doesn't talk about it as if you did wrong. He says, I loved you and you left me. If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. Then Elijah said to them, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left, but Baal has 450 prophets. Get two bulls for us. Let Baal's prophets choose one for themselves and let them cut it into pieces and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. I will prepare the other bull and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. Then you call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord. The God who answers by fire, he is God. Then all the people said, what you say is good. He says, prepare an altar, the wood. The altar was the scene in which God moved. The altar... We have benches. I want to be clear. These aren't altars. They're benches. In the Old Testament, they had altars because that was the only place that God moved. Now we understand what is physically represented through the bench is what spiritually takes place in your heart. Your heart is the scene in which God moves. I want to be really clear on this. And I don't, I don't want to offend you because of this reason, but... I don't give altar calls. And if I could just take a second and explain why. I don't give altar calls because it was described to me as growing up that the altar was the place of prayer. I don't want you to think that this is the place of prayer. I want you to understand that everywhere is the place of prayer. I want you to understand that every single scene in your life is the place of surrender to the Lord. I don't want you going through on a Thursday and have God moving your life and go, oh, I can't pray it through. I'm, there's, there's no bench here. <laughs> like, I can't pray to God in this moment. I'm, I'm missing the benches. I need to wait till Sunday for God to really move. Everywhere you move, everywhere you live is the scene in which God moves because it takes place in your very soul. He says, get an altar. You already have a life, that's your altar. But then he says, the God who answers by fire, prepare the sacrifice, but do not set fire to it. The God who answers by fire, he is the Lord. Fire, over and over again in scripture and still in our language today, represents life, warmth, represents passion, 
re represents the purification from things that should have never been there. In Scripture, it most clearly is the very Spirit of God present upon our lives. He says, the Lord who answers by fire, he is the Lord. And then it gets fun. Verse 25, Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one of the bulls and prepare it first. Since there are so many of you, I love this. He's like, you guys have home field advantage. We'll receive in the second half. There we go. Come on. Let's go kick it off. Call on the name of your God, but do not light the fire. So they took the bull given them and prepared it. Then they called on the name of Baal from morning till noon. Baal, answer us, they shouted. But there was no response. No one answered. And they danced around the altar they had made. At noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder. <laughs> Surely he is a God. Perhaps he is deep in thought or busy or traveling. Maybe he is sleeping and must be awakened. So they shouted louder and slash themselves with swords and spears as was their custom until their blood flowed. Midday passed and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice. But there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. Let me set the scene for you. They gather at their altar. And it says, they begin to yell and shout and scream and dance, but that's not happening today. Could we just acknowledge that? This is the best that you're gonna get, church, okay. <laughs> they did it, not here. <laughs> and they go, they go all around in, in this, this sacrifice that they have prepared and they've got the animal across and they go, if we just keep screaming, if we just do it with more intensity, if we just bring our energy, like I like to imagine like how this came, like, like they get here, they get the animal ready to go. I've got the feeling that like seven nation army starts playing on the loudspeakers. <laughs> no one else a fan of the white stripes? Going the dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Dun, 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 dun. There we go. There's a, no, no more, no more. We got, we got like 20 more verses to cover. And they keep going. They're like, come on, Baal. Come on, send fire. And then this is the best part of the whole thing. Elijah, all the way over here, about noon, he's had enough. But like, we're talking like three hours of dancing and yelling. And Elijah's all the way over here. And he's like, he gets bored. He's like, shout louder. Maybe he's sleeping. <laughs> he's meditating. Did you God go to the beach? <laughs> this is the best. I love it. No, no wonder Ahab thinks that Elijah is a troublemaker. He's a trash talker. <laughs> like how annoying would that be? I, I know this. I have a trash talker in my family, Parker. I, I promise you, I don't know where he got it from because I don't talk trash. I just like smile and giggle. That's about the most I've got in me. And they say, Parker talks trash all the time. The, the other day I said, Parker, clean your room. And he goes, you clean your room. <laughs> I said, stop it, man. And he goes, clean your face. I lost. I didn't even know we were going at each other. I lost. <laughs> Clean your face. Fine. <laughs> this is Elijah. Elijah here is like, he's resting. They keep dancing. Seven Nation Army keeps playing. Some of you are going to go home and you're going to jam out to Seven Nation Army because you have no idea what I'm talking about. And then you'll be like, oh, that's what it is. That was the melody. He was singing the melody? Oh, that was weird. That sounds nothing like what I'm actually hearing through the speakers of my car. He keeps talking trash. Nothing happens. Nothing happens. It's so weird, isn't it? And then, and then this is the part that makes me uncomfortable, is it says they cut themselves. That throw anyone else off? They cut themselves. For the God that they had made up, they had this idea that if they suffered and bled for the God that they had made up, that that God 
would answer, man, I don't know if I'm uh, making you uncomfortable sitting on the bench altar prayer thing. It makes me a little uncomfortable. Can I just tell you that? That this morning, uh, two of my kids were in the room, and I said something about what we were going through, because I was like, I need this light, because I'm going to sit on the altar. And then I turned around, and two of my kids were sitting on the benches. I was like, get up. You said you're going to do it. But mine's part of a sermon illustration. It's fine. You get up. It makes me uncomfortable. Not as uncomfortable as uh, the last time we took communion, and uh, one of my kids later that day said to me, said, do you want a snack? Sure. And they opened up their bag and they had like 20 packets of communion in their bag. It's like, no, 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 that's not what that's for. These are not snacks. And that same kid actually earlier in service when we took the body of Jesus, she uh, dipped it in the blood of Jesus first before she took it. No, 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 that's not what that's for. It makes me uncomfortable. <laughs> Uh, when I was a kid, our altars did not have these things here, and they're like really slick. So when no adults were in the sanctuary, I'd come in and I would just try to slide the whole way down all of them. It was amazing. <laughs> it's, it's weird because like you're not supposed to sit on it. They're, you're meant to kneel at it, right? I'm sitting on what I'm supposed to be surrendering to, right? So it looks, feels weird. So why do you do it? Why are we sitting at the place where we were supposed to be surrendered? I, I had this thought for the longest time in my life that in order for God to move during a service, my message had to be perfect. And so I'd spend, oh, so much time just getting every detail, everything. I get so frustrated if I missed a section or said something wrong because it was like, God didn't move because, because I didn't say this how I intended to say it. The idea that the move of God was contingent upon my ability, not my availability. My talent, not my openness. And so I'd suffer and I'd beat myself up when it didn't go right I bled for it when I should have been surrendered to it. Altars weren't meant to be sat on. They were meant to be surrendered to. How often do we create gods of our own making, suffer for them, and get shocked when the fire doesn't come? Let me step on all sorts of toes. How much time have you spent parents of children driving your kids to thousands of activities, sports games, sports practice, academic event, thing after thing after thing, assuming if they get a little bit ahead of all the other kids? Man, I got my kids' report cards. You know what I look at? Where are you? Where's average? You're above. I'm doing a good job. Too much honesty? If you're above average, I feel great. We're crushing it as parents. Even though my five-year-old at the time could name 22 of the 30 NFL teams by logo and he couldn't count to nine. <laughs> but that was like, that was my feeling like, oh, I'm doing it right because I've got that. How often, different category, have your emotions been affected positively or negatively by the number of likes, comments, or interactions on a post that you took? And you feel a little better about yourself that day because that many people liked your photoshopped, cropped, edited picture. <laughs> or the sense that if I, if I hit this spot in my career or this spot in my career or if I just get up to this income bracket or if I just get this next level, then, then I'll feel satisfied. But does it ever end? See, the, the, the problem is on the one hand, for many of us, we may think that that next level is the thing that will bring us meaning. That's not when the crisis hits. The crisis hits when you actually hit the top and you realize that it was all empty to begin with. And we bleed, suffer, work ourselves to death over altars that we created. And we're shocked 
when our lives feel empty, when our lives feel cold, when it feels meaningless. Let's not judge the prophets of that day too hard because oh, how often we've done the same thing. They dance, they yell, but no one answered, no response, no one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, verse 30, come here to me. They came to him and he repaired the altar of the Lord which had been torn down. Elijah took 12 stones, one for each of the tribes descended from Jacob to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, your name shall be Israel. Elijah makes this really bold move. The nation of Israel had been split in two because they couldn't get along. Instead of focusing on the greater things that God had called them to, they obsess about the lesser things and they decide they can no longer live in community with each other. Elijah puts 12 stones together to remind them of who they were created to be. This is my role today, to remind you of who you were created to be. You were not meant to go through life aimless. You were not meant to go through life in isolation. You were not meant to wonder and wander all your days. Is God actually doing something? You are loved by the Most High God. There is a call of God upon your life. There are things for you to do that God has assigned directly to you and no one else. There should never be a doubt in your head. Does God love? Does he care? Does he move? This is who you've been created to be. See, church, I need you to see this. Even if no one else followed God, God would be confident to restart the whole thing based upon you. That is the responsibility that you are meant to be able to carry. To say, if everyone else falls away, if I stay obedient and the Spirit of the Lord is in me, that is enough for God to do exactly what he seeks to do. Come on, church, let's celebrate that today. That's what God believes in you. That's what God knows you to be. With the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he dug a trench around it large enough to hold two seas of seed. He arranged the wood, cut the bull into pieces, and laid it on the wood. Then he said to them, fill four large jars with water and pour it on the offering in the wood. Man, I love Elijah. They're in the middle of a drought. He's praying for fire, and he's like, come on, dump the water. Do it again, he said, and they did it again. Do it a third time, he ordered, and they did it the third time. Estimates say that they dumped 300 gallons of water in the middle of a drought on the altar. The water ran down around the altar and even filled the trench. At the time of the sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, the God who has moved, the God who we know about his wonders and might, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, Lord, answer me. So these people will know that you, Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, the soil, and the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. I want you to know today that God's fire still falls. The fire that warms, that takes the empty, lifeless life and restores to it a sense that this is real, that this is meaningful. God's fire still falls. God's fire still falls that it purifies because this is what fire does. 
When I was a youth pastor, there was a girl in our youth group who was dating a guy that wasn't good for her. And her parents tried endlessly to get them to break up. Usually not a great move, parents, just so you know, on that note. Then God got a hold of her life and she dropped him within a week going, I don't know what I was thinking having him in my life. See, when God moves in your life, it purifies the things that never should have been there. You might not need more. You may have too much of a bad thing already in your life for God to move, for him to do what he was meant to do. His fire still falls. There is a difference between enthusiasm and passion. For many of us, we pursue enthusiasm. We want that next new thing that will bring us a sense of life. There is meant to be something deeper within your soul that brings life to your bones, that gives you energy all the days of your life. If you're hurting and lifeless, his fire still falls. His work still happens. He still moves in our lives. So here's my question. What does Elijah do? What do we do? Like God sent the fire, Elijah didn't send the fire. What, what exactly did Elijah do in all this? for him to encounter God. Just one thing. Verse 30. Then Elijah said to all the people, come here to me, they came to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been turned down. Elijah goes to the scene in which God moves. This, is, this was never meant to be here. I was never meant to be on the altar. This is what I'm supposed to be surrendered to. Can, can I ask you a difficult question today? What's on the altar? What is taken preeminence before God? What has been placed in a position of priority over the very move of God in your life? Is there something else you're looking to, believing in, that if this goes right or if this happens how it was supposed to, then I'll make it. Then I'll be alive. Elijah goes, mm. The altar, the altar needs to be set right. The scene for God to move needs to be cleared in order for God to do his greatest work. My call to you today is repair the altar. Repair the altar in your life. Put God back in his rightful place. Remove what never should have been there. Can, can I say it to you like this? Like, Yesterday I watched college football. I know many of you did. Okay, we're not going there. No, 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 there we go. Thank you. But yesterday I watched college football. One of the games I was watching, I watched it for an hour and 20 minutes. Nothing happened. In an hour and 20 minutes, nothing interesting happened in the entire game. And yet there I am still glued to the TV. And then I wake up in the morning with scripture and I give God like five minutes. Five minutes and I'm just like, well, I didn't hear anything. It's time to move on. I didn't sense anything. It's time to keep going. Could you give God at least as long as you have given everything else? Everything else in your tribe. Give God at least as long to move, to do his work. Man, what if you actually came before God and you wasn't, God, quick fix me. God, give it to me right away in the moment that I want it for the thing that I want. But it was, Lord, here I am. Move in the way that you have sought to move. Move in my life. I don't care if I'm uncomfortable. Move in my life. God, I'm putting you back first. I'm seeking you first. I'm coming to you before all the other things. And I may stand alone, but I know you're the one that's real. I know you're the one that's moving. I know you're the one that still sends fire in our lives today. Elijah must repair what he never tore down. 
you may not have broken your own altar. Something may have happened to you. Instead of saying it slipped in priority, you may have a story to tell of all the things that you've endured. You didn't cause it, but it's still under your responsibility. Repair the altar and watch God move. Church, would you stand with me in this moment? I invite you to bow your heads and close your eyes in a posture of prayer. And I want to ask you, do you really want God to move? Do you really want him to do what only he can do? Repair the altar. Tell God in this moment, man, I don't need to know it all. I don't need to understand it all. But if you're God, then I'm following you. Even if it's difficult, even if it's hard, even if it's uncomfortable, I'm following you. Even if it doesn't come easy, even if it doesn't come in the way that I expected, I'm following you. Heavenly Father, in this moment, I pray for every individual whose altars have gotten out of order. I pray for my own life. And even in ministry, the, the lack of focus that allows the place of your presence to slip from where it should always be seated securely. God, for all of us, I believe deep within my heart that we desire you. Give us hearts that desire something strong enough that only you can fill. Let us not settle our weak will for lesser things. Let us not allow our appetite to simply eat whatever is placed in front of us, but let us care enough about who we are and who we've been created to become that we settle for nothing less than you, Lord. Church, I want to ask you today if you're in a position that maybe you've never accepted God into your life. And you think you've been living a life that has just been testing or trying or that's maybe even a tad disobedient. But you need to come to the awareness that it is a betrayal of what God wants to do in your life and the relationship he has with you. And I want you to know that you are forgiven the moment in which you turn. You are loved already and that God has prepared a place for you in eternity and seeks to work in all the days of your life. And all you have to do is to accept him, to say, yes, Lord, that's what I want. And so church, I want to ask you today, if you've never accepted that into your life and you want to, would you in this very moment right now, raise your hand with no one else looking around and say, yes, God, that's what I want. I want you in my life. Just slip your hand up in this moment as a sign of that confession and that desire in your life. Yes, I see that hand. Yes. 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 church, I'm just going to invite you in this moment of prayer, not to say anything out loud, but just to speak to God himself and to say, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Lord, I believe that very, this day, that we've had a moment a moment in which we have encountered you, and I believe with every soul of my being that moments lead to movements, that it was not meant to stay here, but your presence was meant to overflow 
into our families, into our friends, into our workplaces. May this be a moment that is marked by your spirit and your presence and that we would understand that we are different because we have been in the presence of the Most High God. But let that sense not create a lack of desire for you, but let it stoke something deep within our souls that acknowledges that we settle for nothing less than your work, your presence, nothing less than your might and power, nothing less than your glory and honor all the days of our life. Amen. Amen. Church, can we celebrate what God is doing in our midst today?